Hello and thank you for joining me today for the latest in the monthly Global Mapper webcast series. My name is David McKittrick, Senior Application Specialist here at Blue Marble Geographics. The topic of today's presentation, as you can see on the slide, is working with vector data in Global Mapper. We're going to be doing a lot with the digitizer in Global Mapper. Uh, working with points, lines, polygons, both creating data and indeed editing data as well. So today's topic is basically anything and everything related to working with the digitizer. This is a recording, so obviously the opportunity to ask questions is, is not available. Um, I will uh, offer in the description at the bottom of the presentation or at the bottom of the video uh, a link to where you can email any questions. You can email our help desk at any time with questions you may have about this topic or indeed any topic and uh, we will also share that information in the in the slide at the end of today's presentation. So there will be opportunity for you to ask questions but unfortunately given the fact that this is a recorded presentation um, we don't have the mechanism for doing that in real time. So the agenda for today's presentation includes uh, a basic introduction to the function of the digitizer. What exactly is the digitizer in Global Mapper? And we will introduce some of the key components at a very high level for those of you who perhaps have never used the drawing functions or the, the digitizing functions in the application. Um, we'll look at some of the configuration settings. I will give you some recommendations for perhaps changing some of those default settings to, to change the behavior, to change how you interact with your, your vector data. Um, we will then go through the process of drawing. Uh, we will introduce the very basics of drawing points, drawing lines, and drawing polygons or area features. Um, there are variations on those themes, a few more specialized tools um, that you may not have encountered um, that will allow you to create those features in, in a more specialized way. So we'll introduce not only the basic tools, but also a few more, uh, a few more advanced tools as well. Um, inevitably, when you work with vector data in Global Mapper, you will encounter the Modify Feature Info dialog box. It is the dialog box that lets you determine where, layer, uh, where objects are placed in terms of the layer assignment, how they appear, um, both for creating data and indeed for editing data. You will encounter this, this component of the software. So we will formally introduce that and again give you some recommendations as to how to apply this or how to use the, uh, the various settings and various configuration options um, in an efficient way. Um, we'll talk a little bit about rendering vector features. Um, obviously, when you bring data into Global Mapper or when you create data, there's a certain default appearance. Um, we will talk about some of the options you have for customizing that appearance, for changing the visual characteristics. Um, we have, in the past, conducted more uh, broad uh, presentations on this theme, uh, introducing concepts like thematic mapping. We're not going to go into too much depth today, but just to introduce the idea that that default color that you're so used to seeing does not have to appear. Your features don't have to appear with that color. You do have options for changing those. So rendering uh, vector features uh, um, is our, our next section. We'll talk about editing vector features, um, as well as drawing, as well as be, uh, manually creating objects. We will go through the process of taking objects that already exist, perhaps files that you have imported, shape files or CAD files, and modifying them, modifying the geometric structure, changing their shape, changing their, their scale, changing the rotation angle, right down to the vertex level, how you can modify those features. Um, we'll go through various mechanisms that you can employ to change that, that structure. We'll talk about converting vector features, and when we talk about conversion in this context, uh, what we mean is taking points, perhaps, and making a line, or taking a polygon or an area, and creating points, perhaps, that uh, uh, correspond with the vertices defining the boundary of that polygon. So there are multiple variations on that, and we'll explore um, basically whatever data you have, chances are you can convert that into another form. For instance, if you have a line feature uh, denoting the boundary, perhaps, of a property and your objective is to determine the area of that property. Obviously if it's a line that's not a, a byproduct uh, of that uh, data structure but it's very easy to convert that into an area and we'll, again we'll go through various options as far as uh, that workflow is concerned. Um, we'll get into some more specific editing 
functions, splitting, combining polygons and lines. If you've got two line segments or more than two line segments, essentially creating just one. Or for that matter, if you've got multiple line segments, or, or one line segment and you want to create multiple line segments, again, the mechanism uh, for creating uh, more than one line segment uh, from a single line segment. We'll also talk about splitting, taking a polygon and splitting it, perhaps dissecting it based on an intersecting line or something of that uh, type. So we'll go through, again, various... Uh, uh, workflows that relate to splitting and combining features. And then I've got a section at the end, and this is going to be time dependent, um, called Advanced Digitizer Tools. Uh, there are some um, very specific components, very specific features and functions of the software th that we can employ to explore multiple different uh, ways of either creating data or modifying data. And again, I'll try to base this on, on actual workflow, on actual real world scenarios, the use of some of these advanced tools uh, to, to match perhaps some of the, uh, the tasks that you would uh, anticipate performing within the application. So the first bullet on the list is introducing the digitizer. We're going to spend a little bit of time just uh, pointing out the various uh, components in Global Mapper that allow you to interact with vector data. Before we even get to that level, we'll talk a little bit about the structure of vector data, what exactly uh, a vector feature is and what defines a vector feature. So this is a very high level introduction to the idea of working with vector data in Global Mapper. So in Global Mapper, the key tool that you will be required to activate in order for you to interact with your vector files, whether it be shape files or CAD files or objects that you've digitized yourself, features you, you've drawn yourself, the, is the digitizer tool. And it's quite clearly noted in the toolbar right here at the top, the digitizer tool. By default, when you load, uh, launch Global Mapper for the first time, it'll be in zoom mode. You'll see my zoom tool is now the active tool, although I don't have any map data loaded right now, so it's a little uh, redundant. But when I um, select the Digitizer tool, one thing you will notice when that tool is activated is the introductory buttons that we are grown accustomed to seeing have now disappeared. And the simple reason for that is because in this mode, in digitizing mode, what appeared as an introductory screen is now rendered as a map. And to verify that, you can even see at the bottom of my screen, as I move my cursor around, I've got coordinate information displayed here. So this is actually, although there's no data loaded, this is actually a map view as opposed to an introductory screen view. And if I chose to, I could select one of the tools for drawing points or lines or areas and initiate the digitizing process right now. I could begin the process of drawing. Now, in reality, and in, in, in most practical uh, applications, the likelihood of you actually doing this is, is fairly remote because we don't have a frame of reference. We don't have any, any visible features on the map to trace or to interact with. So the idea of just digitizing on a blank slate is not very realistic. But just to, by way of illustrating the tool, you can see without any map data loaded, my digitizer is now active. Now, you will also note that the cursor, um, as it's moving around, you'll notice it's a crosshair. The crosshair denotes the target point for wherever I click. Um, but you'll also notice it says edit. And this is an indication that in its native mode, Global Mapper is an editing tool. It is right now waiting for me to select something that I can apply some sort of edit to. For instance, I could move a feature. I could delete a feature. I can restructure a feature. Those are some of the options I could apply after selecting. So right now, there's no active drawing tool. I am in edit mode. So. Obviously, again, very unrealistic in this case because I don't have any data to work with. Let's rectify this situation. I'm going to import a vector file. Now, I'm, going to sp I'm not going to spend a lot of time in the import process for those completely new to Global Mapper. We do have introductory presentations getting started with the software. But the process of getting data into Global Mapper is very simple. From the file menu, you can simply choose Open Data File. Or you can use the little folder button right where my cursor is located in the top left corner of my screen. Or you can simply drag and drop a file onto the map. Any of those options would work. In my case, I'm going to initiate the opening process from the file menu. And I'm going to do a recent file. Uh, you'll see a shape file uh, listed here. This is a, uh, a shape file denoting the bounds of, of the towns in the state of Maine, our home state here. Um, before I do that, I'm going to go back to my default tool. I'm going to go back to my zoom tool. Now, the reason for that is because when I choose the digitizer, as I mentioned, the screen is now an active map. And as such, it has an active projection. You notice it's geographic projection. So 
As I import a file, it's going to be dynamically reprojected to adhere to this system. And that's not something I want to do. I'm going to revert back to the default introductory screen. So the initial projection is going to be defined by the projection that is natively applied to the file. And I believe it's UTM, as you will see in just one second. So from my recent list, choose main towns. And as you'll see here, we have our vector file now loaded. I'm confirming this is a UTM zone 19 projection. So now that I have a, a file loaded, if I go back and select the digitizer one more time, again, I have edit by default. And I'm not going to proceed any further with any of the specific editing tasks. We will get to that a little bit later. But this now does give me the option to select either one or perhaps more than one object in this layer. And then again, apply whatever edits we need, deleting, removing, uh, or sorry, moving, rotating, scaling, etc, etc, etc. So in its native mode, as you can see, the, the uh, digitizer is an editing tool. I'm just going to use the escape button on my keyboard to deselect those uh, features that I just selected. And to draw your attention to another important component of the digitizer by way of introduction. And that's the toolbar along, in my case, it's along the bottom row of my toolbar interface, as you can see. Um, depending on your resolution, depending on uh, how large your uh, display is, this may be actually in the top line. Or indeed, you can undock this. We could drag it to another location, perhaps drag it to a second monitor if we want to save a little bit of screen real estate and drive this collection of buttons. But in my case, as I said, it occupies most of the bottom row of buttons. These are my digitizer tools. These are my tools that will allow me to more specifically either create or interact with those selected objects. And we will be um, working through a lot of these scenarios as we go through today's presentation. Um, on the left side, you'll see as I um, hover my cursor, uh, this first button is for creating areas. This is basically the polygon creation tool. Its next door neighbor allows me to create rectangles. And again, we'll go through the rest of these buttons and, and uh, uh, indicate the function that they serve. Now, if I select one of these buttons, um, my digitizer uh, tool will um, change from being an editor to being a tool for creating an area. And you'll see that now right here on the screen, it says area. But again, we will go back to, to addressing that um, a little bit later. So I'm just going to toggle that button off right now. Now, you, I showed you the method for selecting objects using the digitizer in its edit mode, either one object or multiple objects. Um, there is another selection option that's available on my toolbar, and that's our feature info tool. And we have dealt with this in uh, some more detail when we talked about attributes. Uh, we're not really going to deal with attributes too much today, but obviously a byproduct of working with vector data is all of the objects on my screen have attribution. Um, this is, again, I just demonstrate another selection option. Um, um, can't see this actually popped up on my second window. I'll drag this into view. But you can see after selecting um, an object on the map, um, a vector object, it displays all of the information pertaining to that object. With that function, I can only select one at a time. I can't drag to select like I was able to do with the digitizer. But I just wanted to distinguish between these two selection options. The, the feature info is simply a, it's almost like a query tool. Give me information about this uh, feature. The digitizer is a geometric editing tool. It allows me to select a feature for the purpose of, of applying some sort of modification to it. Now the other thing I want to point out at this stage by way of introduction in terms of kind of uh, painting the picture if you like as to how Global Mapper interacts with vector data is the right click menu. With the digitizer selected and with my cursor positioned anywhere on my screen, if I click my right uh, uh, mouse button, you'll notice that it opens up a menu of options with a number of submenus in there as well. You can see the little arrows indicating there's additional options. Um, we will uh, address some of these as we go through various components of the digitizer. But um, suffice to say, we have essentially um, a list of tools that let us create new features, areas, lines, or points, a number of advanced options, and a few additional um, modification tools are available here. Now, truthfully, this list is fairly limited right now because I don't have anything selected. So it will not be able to apply a selected uh, workflow to a, a particular uh, object that I've selected on the map. If I select an object, either one or more objects, and I reinitiate that right click menu, again, digitizer has been selected, I'm going to right click, you'll notice that list becomes a lot longer, because now it's going to apply whatever I select from this list 
to what has been selected, a single feature or multiple selected features. So again, as we go through various workflows today, as we go through the process of creating, modifying, and you know, introducing some of those uh, more advanced tools, we will be accessing this right-click menu. So between the toolbar buttons, and the right click menu as you can see there's a lot of digitizing functionality a lot of ways of interacting with your vector data in global mapper so the next bullet on my list is the digitizer configuration settings um, I want to introduce you to a few of the specific um, settings or, or, or options that you can apply that will change the way the digitizer behaves there's actually a couple of ways of accessing these options there are certain options that are going to be accessible by simply right-clicking as we uh, showed you in the previous section um, but there's an entire uh, uh, component of the configuration dialog box which allows you to establish these global settings as well now as well as the kind of the overall settings I also want to take a look very quickly at settings that can be applied to a specific layer uh, within the overlay control center within the window that controls uh, the uh, layer behavior in the application you can select a layer and there are options that can be applied so that would be no that would not be a global setting but that would actually be something that would apply just to a layer so uh, multiple ways of, of addressing this idea of changing the settings particular uh, specific to your vector data so with the same layer loaded my, my main towns layer um, I'm going to go to the configuration dialog box um, easiest way to access this is one, uh, using the button in the toolbar. I'm going to count one, two, three, four, five. Sixth button in from the left, right here on the top row of my toolbar buttons. It looks like a wrench or a spanner and a, a, a screwdriver crossed here. This is the configuration uh, dialog box, or this is how you access the configuration dialog box. There is also an option under the tools menu configure will also open the same dialog box and when you access this component of the software you'll see that there are multiple tabs that allow you to apply your settings uh, there's a general area a catch-all for um, settings like uni units of measurement whether to display a grid on the map there are a number of options that are particular specific to working with uh, 3d data vertical options shader options and lidar there's projection as an option this is how you'll reproject your data and then there are four tabs tabs that are specifically applied to working with vector files. First one of those is vector display. And I'll very quickly go through some of the highlights in here. Now it is important to note that whatever we we set here is global in nature. In other words, if I change one of the settings, it will apply regardless of what data I've loaded, regardless of what layers I'm working with, regardless of what workspace you're working with. So this is where you will go once to change these behaviors, assuming that's the way you want the, the software to to behave in the future then you don't have to go back here again now at the top level we can choose uh, whether to render collectively all areas all lines or all points and as you can see and as we'd normally expect they're all checked so if I import a line layer lines will be displayed if I import a point layer likewise now this I would suggest if you quickly want to turn off all layers but your point layers for whatever we just want to isolate your points perhaps it's just a simple case of checking the box I won't leave the dialog box open having unchecked areas click apply and as you would expect that layer is no longer visible. We'll turn it back on again. Now, I've gone through uh, more than one uh, workflow where I have changed one of these settings and forgotten that I'd done it, import a layer later with some points in it, and it takes me a while to figure out why my points are not being displayed. Well, chances are, if you're encountering something like that, uh, one of these settings has been changed and you forgot to revert it again. So just be careful with this. Um, that's, this is your first place to check if you are not seeing objects you would expect to see on the map. So rendering selecting from is a similar setting um, in which if you want to simply interact with your areas in a visual context but do not want to select them they're not selectable either with the feature info tool or for that matter with the digitizer you can again at a higher high, the highest level uncheck those if necessary now there's a further layer of filtering that allows us to turn off certain types of features within the areas, lines, and points uh, categories. We'll come back and visit this a little bit later when we talk about feature types and the importance of feature types when you're working with vector data. But this is, again, a, a, a um, feature type specific filtering that can be applied to clean up your workflow and clean up your interface when you're digitizing. Um, some other options here, I'm not going to touch on everything, but vector 
uh, layer ordering by default global mapper will apply a certain logic to the layer order uh, so that points will logically be on top uh, polygons will or areas will logically be on bottom regardless of the uh, order in which those features are displayed in the overlay control center um, you can override that behavior by checking the second radio button which allows you to specify the order by what's uh, displayed in the overlay control center a lot of context here because we only have one layer loaded but if we had multiple layer there's loaded and we wanted the layer order to dictate the display order we could choose that second option and adjust the uh, order hierarchy in the overlay control center to reflect our requirements moving towards the bottom you can see there's a number of checkboxes and again I'm not going to go through all of them some I do want to point out you'll notice a couple specifically related to displaying vertices or shape points we will address those a little bit later when we get to the the uh, point of actually editing some features where we can choose a vertex and delete it or move it um, we get down to the the um, level where we can specifically change the geometric structure and for those you will want to display your vertices so you can see exactly what's being changed a couple of different options one is to render all area line vertices and the second is to just render those that are so those for features that are selected I would suggest if you are interested in vertex display perhaps choosing the second option would be the better choice um, You'll notice that labels are displayed by default. We're not going to be dealing with labeling today. That's again been, been addressed in a previous presentation. But if you wanted to label these features, or for that matter, if you wanted to turn off all labels, you can simply uncheck this box. All of your labels will be rendered invisible. You will not get labels displayed. Um, most of these are fairly intuitive. Now, there is one additional uh, checkbox or one checkbox I do want to recommend that you select when working with your vector data, specifically when working with area features. Now, if you recall, when I selected an object on the screen previously, and you can see I'm still interacting with my map even if the dialog box is open, but you can see this selection process um, or the, the fact that it's selected is indicated by this hatch pattern. I'm going to select uh, several polygons. You'll notice, again, they're all selected. Now, so that all the whatever appearance was previously assigned to these will be replaced with this hatch pattern. Um, unfortunately, with this default behavior, it's difficult for me, and in fact, it's impossible for me to distinguish between what's selected in here between the individual features. I have a multi multiple features selected, but 67 specifically, you can see that at the bottom of my screen below my scale bar. But there's no way to distinguish them because the selection shader, the, the way that they're represented, um, is applied consistently across the area of, of those features that are selected. Now, if you opt as I do in my setup, to only highlight the border of selected area features, it will change that appearance. Again, I'll click the Apply button. And what you'll see now is rather than filling in the polygon with a hatch pattern, it highlights the border of that. Now, that has two benefits that I see. One is you're able now to distinguish. Uh, even if they're selected, you're still able to distinguish what's been selected. Uh, but also, Regardless of your scale, regardless of how small the feature is, that line thickness will be retained. So uh, even something that's very, very small, it's very clear that it's been selected. Simply filling in a hatch pattern, you do not have that ability. You cannot see that's, that that has been selected. So that is my personal recommendation. Obviously, it's not required, but that is my personal recommendation. Only highlight the border of selected area features. Once this has been checked, and I'll leave it checked for today, it will be retained throughout every workspace and every session, uh, every global mapper session. Um, a couple of others I want to point out um, right towards the bottom. Um, we have options for snapping. Now, snapping, as you will see when we create uh, our area features, is the process whereby every additional object you create, every additional feature we create, will by default um, snap to or connect with an existing feature. It's on by default. That, that functionality will be on by default. But you can see there's options here to limit that functionality. First of all, disabling it completely is an option. You can also opt only to snap to point features. Um, the P key held down is a toggle to turn that on. You can also opt only to snap to vertices. Now, vertices or shape points 
So those uh, nodes, if you like, that define the structure of a vector feature, line or polygon. And if this is a choice is made, it will not snap to a line uh, or a segment, or segment of a line, but rather will snap to one of the, the vertices. Um, so it will ensure if you're digitizing abutting polygons, for instance, that you're only going to snap to where the adjacent shape points are. Again, that's an option you can enable to provide a more flexible uh, snapping behavior. So these are a set of uh, settings uh, that apply to how you interact with your vector files or vector data. The three additional tabs I drew your attention to earlier say area styles, line styles, and point styles. I'm going to look at area styles specifically. We're not going to worry about line styles and point styles today, but suffice to say, functionality or the, the behavior that's defined in area styles can be replicated under line styles and point styles as well. Now, in this dialog box, you will see a list of default styles uh, for vector features. These are um, visual characteristics and also attributes that can be preset. Now, a lot of these um, have been installed with the application. Land grant, land area, major national parks are all feature styles that you can apply to your data um, as it's loaded or after it's loaded. Chances are most of you would probably be interested in some other types of features and I will address that when we actually get into digitizing in a few minutes where we can uh, define the visual appearance by creating a feature type or creating a style um, that we can apply very quickly to something that we digitize. So um, this list, list, uh, this list uh, uh, provides information about all of the pre-configured area styles and it lets, it lets us override the default appearance if necessary, change the appearance it also allows us, as I mentioned, to add attribution. So if I create a major national park uh, and digitize it and assign it to this feature type, um, it will be pre-populated with whatever attributes I think are relevant um, for that particular feature. So area styles, line styles, point styles can be customized. Um, and we will see this in action when we digitize in a few minutes. By the way, for point styles, one of the options is to actually add a custom symbol. You can import any graf graphic file and apply that to a, a point type that you've created yourself. So um, you can actually designate what that point will look like as a custom graphic file. Um, a, a word of caution before you get carried away with this function, when you add a point to the map, you are designating a particular location, a specific lat long. Do not make your symbols too large because the context of what's being tagged will be lost if the actual symbol ends up being a very, very large graphic file. But um, So that is an option you have under point styles, the ability to import a graphic file for rendering a point on the map. So those are the, some of the options, some of the configuration options that are applied at a global level. We'll click OK just to close the dialog box. Now the other thing I wanted to point out in this section is the options, the, er the uh, array of options can be applied to a layer. Now unlike what I did before where we were uh, changing the global settings, the options button in the overlay control center will only apply to what it sees selected here. If I click the options, um, a few things can be uh, changed at this level. Now, where previously we addressed the idea of labeling at a global level, now we can control the labels at the layer level as well. We can also determine attribute assignment for specifically for elevation. If we have point data, for instance, and we want to designate one of our attributes to be a Z, val Z or Z value, we can make that assignment. Um, we can change the, the visual characteristics of our layer um, by applying a feature type. The previously mentioned feature types can be applied for everything in the layer using this drop down. Um, again, we'll address that a little bit later. And overriding that if necessary, we have a specific tab for changing the style. Um, while it will use the default based on that previous selection, we can override that as well here. We can specify, regardless of what feature type, we can specify the visual characteristics at the layer level. So everything in the layer would be um, a particular fill pattern, a particular border style if necessary. There is also options to apply styling based on an attribute and indeed for um, polygons you can assign random colors to features you can see as you can see. So we'll get into rendering that was one of my bullets a little bit later we'll talk a little bit more about rendering. But this set of options this dialog box unlike the configuration dialog box introduced previously this is specific to a particular selected layer or indeed layers. If you shift click to select multiple layers, you can change the settings um, as they apply to multiple layers. 
Now there's one final thing I want to point out um, as far as configuration is concerned and not specifically related to working with the vector data but certainly very relevant in that context and that is the favorites list. The favorites list um, create, allows you to create a, um, a subset of tools that defines how you typically work within the application. And you'll see the option to set up the favorites list here. Um, for those of you who are fairly new to Global Mapper, this might be a little out of context, but you can see a long list of options um, as far as how you can create or modify features. I'm going to choose one specifically here, uh, the option to create a new area feature. I'm going to check that box. I'm want to click OK because with that now checked and, and uh, selected that's always going to be available in this list so while you will see in a few minutes when we get into that right click menu some of the tools are are in sub menus sometimes difficult to remember where to access a particular tool if you find yourself using a particular tool again and again and again this is a good place to store it so you can simply select that tool and click the arrow button or hit control and enter as a keyboard shortcut and it will activate that tool for you so you no longer have to memorize exactly where that is. Now an alternative to that approach is actually to assign keyboard shortcuts to those commonly used tools. I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to go any further with that but if you open up that dialog box you can assign a a keyboard shortcut or a combination of keys um, that will allow you to activate again a selected tool. Benefit of the drop down or the uh, the favorites list is the the item is always going to be named here, so you don't have to remember a shortcut. You may assign five keyboard shortcuts, but unless you actually remember what they're assigned to, it's kind of a redundant function. Whereas with this favorites list, it's very easy to access, very easy to select and activate that tool. So. By the way, that list will also populate with recently used tools. So if you find yourself um, using, for instance, the tool for creating circles, um, it will be added to a recently used tools list, and you can simply go back in here, select it from that list without formally adding it as a favorite. So in this next section, we're going to address the idea of creating vector objects, drawing points, lines, and polygons. Now, on the face of it, it's a very simple process. Um, there's a tool for drawing areas, as I showed you before. There's a tool for drawing lines, a couple of variations on that, and a very simple tool for dropping a point on the map and assigning whatever uh, parameters or settings uh, you need. But as we'll see, there are a few more advanced tools that let you do more specifics with those various geometric types. So we'll introduce the, the whole process, the, the multitude of tools that allow you create data, create vector data in global mapper. So I've loaded up a base map of some imagery here. Uh, as I was saying earlier, when you introduce digitizing tools, it's, it's more common that you're going to have some sort of base data to use as a, a, a um, platform on which to digitize. It's very unlikely you're going to actually use a blank slate. So uh, to make this a little more realistic, we brought out some imagery and we'll use some of our digitizing tools to introduce some of those digitizing tools in the context of tracing some of the features that we're able to identify in this view, in this imagery. Now I want to divide this section into kind of logically three sections. One is the uh, adding points, variations on that theme. Uh, second, adding lines and then the third, adding, adding areas or polygons. What you'll see when we add polygons and lines, there is a lot of commonality, a lot of, of uh, similarity, I should say, between those two functions. Um, for instance, we can create um, rectangles using the area tool, but there's a similar, almost identical function for creating a rectangle that actually ends up being a line feature. Um, but we'll introduce each of those three as a kind of a separate section. Let's begin with points. Obviously, the most simple digitizing action is the idea of dropping a point on the map. In, pre, in older versions, if you're using a very old version of Global Mapper, the action of selecting one of these um, toolbar buttons required you to first select the digitizer. So if you find yourself having to activate the digitizer before these buttons even become available, maybe it's a <laughs> time to upgrade to a more recent version. We changed that behavior uh, several generations ago where regardless of what tool you're working with, I'm in zoom mode right now, um, I can immediately so select one of these drawing tools, which which will by default, as you'll see, I'll click the point tool where my cursor is located right now. Um, you'll see it, it activates the digitizer automatically. So eliminated one keystroke made it a lot more simple.
My point tool is now active. And as I move my cursor onto the screen, you might be able to see this is if I put it against a fairly light background, it says point. And um, obviously the idea of dropping a point is simply a single click. This is the most basic digitizing operation. I'm going to designate a point at this location right where I'm seeing this feature on the map. And I'm going to bypass this dialog box for the time being because I want to spend a little bit of time in the next section introducing all of the options in here. We'll simply click OK. And quite difficult to see, but my little point has been added to the map. So obviously that's a very, very simple procedure. Click and add that point. Nothing too complicated. Now, um, variations on that theme. Now, by the, uh, by the way, the action of uh, creating a point, the tool will be retained. The assumption being next time you click, you're going to add another new point. So until you select a different tool, that function is going to be active. A couple of ways to deactivate it. One is to hit the escape button on your keyboard. Another is to simply toggle it off again. And the third is to click the digitizer tool itself which again will automatically toggle off whatever tool has been selected. I'm back into edit mode again. So as I introduced previously. Now also as I introduced previously, the right click menu gives us a number of options for doing some more advanced um, feature creation. Um, we have a submenu here for creating point. Uh, you'll notice it also says text, by the way. I should mention we get this question quite a lot. How do I just put some text on the map? Well, you can put text on the map by dropping a point and selecting a point type of text. Uh, in uh, with uh, which you'll see there's no symbol and you simply type in a label and it just places text without any symbology right at the selected location. So point or text features is this sub menu and you'll see the first option here is exactly what I've done before which is simply create a put a point on the map. Another option is to put a point at a specified position. If I know the lat long or know the UTM coordinates or the state plane, which is the active projection on this screen, if I know what those values are, if I'm looking at a note that somebody has written to me, I need to create a point at that location. This is how you do it. You simply select that option, enter the uh, projection the current uh, location based on the current projection or the geographic coordinates are always going to be available or MGRS military grid reference we can also apply an elevation to that point if necessary but obviously it would just pl uh, place that point at the designated location if you have more than one point and those points are in some sort of tabular form um, you could enter them all this way, but it doesn't really make much sense. In that case, you can physically import a text file or a CSV file with a list of points and create those points collectively. So save yourself a lot of work. But if you've just got an individual point, you just quickly want to create it at a location, that is the way to do it. Other options in this right click menu um, include creating a strike and dip point. This is a very uh, specialized point feature. Um, those of you who are geologists will uh, understand this concept, the idea of strike and dip for geological bedding planes. Um, it will alter the angle of the, the uh, symbol and also the designation of the label for the strike point, the strike of that. So uh, that's a, a very specialized point tool. And the final option in this list is to create or, or to create a point from what's called the quick point. Point creator. Um, this is a library of template points that you can set up to simplify the creation of point features on your map. This floating window will always be available, always uh, up here. You can drag it off screen if you've got a second monitor if necessary. But when you select one of these points, I've got a tower point here, you simply click on the screen and once again confirm all the settings. We'll get to this a little bit later and you'll see that tower now is indicated that location. And if you've got another point type again, uh, very very simple selection process with regard to the different types uh, of points that you have available. And this can be set up and customized using the setup option um, where you choose from the available point types which ones are going to appear in your quick point creator. Very simple, very easy, and very efficient uh, point creation tool. And again, that's accessed from the right click menu under creating point features. The next geometric type of feature are lines. Well, obviously, when we selected a point, it was a single click on the map. Generating a line, obviously, is going to require multiple clicks. And there are a couple of variations on that theme as well. Um, the line tool, as you can see where my cursor is, is right here, third button in from the left. And if I select it, um, it allows me to simply click multiple times to 
uh, designate shape points or nodes for the line feature. I'm tracing this road. I'm just going to terminate it right here. Now, here's the key when you're drawing lines or when you're drawing polygons. When you've finished, it's a right click to finish. So if you're using a trackpad, and it's difficult to digitize with a trackpad, or using a mouse, left click, left click, left click, and when you're done, right click. And again, it it triggers this modify feature into a dialog box. Confirming the settings, you click OK, and you can see that line feature has now been created. There are a couple of variations on that theme. I'm going to point you to a couple of buttons towards the end of the digitizer toolbar where we can activate either right angle draw mode or ortho draw mode. Let me go ahead and activate right angle draw mode with the same tool still selected. I'm still I'm creating lines, but I've activated this mode. Now, when I start the digitizing process now, it begins just like it did before, where I click a starting point and then choose my second point. Now, this is where it changes. After having clicked a second time, because that button has been uh, selected, I'm restricted in where my next uh, vertex can be. It can either be 90 degrees, 180 degrees, straight ahead, or straight back. I'm limited to those 90 degree variations. So it allows you to digitize while maintaining perfect right angles. As you can see, zigzagging through the countryside here, every angle is a perfect right angle. I'm going to hit the escape button with this because I want to save this object and uh, introduce the second of these two buttons, which is similar, except in this case, my drawing is going to be restricted to east, west, north, south. And you can see even my first line segment has to be on a uh, uh, on a base 90 level, either due east, due south, due west, etc. So I have no option to do draw in any other mode. Now that tool can be applied obviously for lines, but it can also be applied when you're drawing areas, which we'll get to in a few minutes. When you're drawing polygons, you can restrict the alignment of your polygons to be either right angles from the first line segment or based on north, south, east, and west. Again, make sure you're aware of having selected that tool and when you're done, deselect it. Otherwise, every additional digitizing action will, um, will apply that setting. So the final drawing tool I want to show you is what we call trace mode. Um, the previous line required me to click every time I placed a shape point or a vertex. Trace mode allows me to click and hold with my cursor and essentially scribble on the map. I'm going to tr trace another road here and I'm clicking and holding with my left mouse button, excuse my wobbling hand here, and you can see, I'll just continue into the woods a little bit here, and you can see as I click and hold that line becomes a curved line. Um, again, we'll confirm the settings. Um, so trace mode allows you basically to, as the name implies, trace an object by simply clicking and holding and moving your cursor around. Now using some other input methods, I'm obviously using a mouse, but if you've got some other input hardware, you can obviously apply that with this tool as well. If you've got a, 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 um, a tablet, for instance, you can you can digitize using that by tracing, essentially tracing that line segment. So alternatives to using a mouse are available. So variations on the theme of line uh, creation. Final subsection is to create areas or create uh, polygons. And this brings us back to the first tool that we addressed earlier, the one all the way over on the left side. This is the probably the tool you're going to most, use most often when digitizing. I'm going to select my area tool. I'm going to trace the boundary of one of these fields. Um, starting in the corner, again, multiple clicks to de define the shape points. And don't worry about, and you notice it snapped to that point I put in the corner, don't worry about the uh, precision. You can update and modify your digitizing process uh, after completing it. Now you will notice that um, I've left a section here. I'm not going to finish this last point just yet. And again, for uh, kind of logistical considerations, when we're finished with this polygon, um, first thing to note is you do not have to finish at the starting point. That will happen automatically. That little black line that you see connecting my final vertex with the starting point indicates that when I uh, complete this polygon, it will be filled, it will be connected. That last line will become part of the boundary of the polygon. So you don't need to click at the point of origin. When you get to that last point, once again, it's a right click to complete. If you, and it's not uncommon, if you put a point down and you realize you've, you've, you've finished the polygon, you've got one straight line segment left, but you've got this dangling tail, Control Z will work here. You can undo by sitting, simply hitting Control Z to remove that last point, or for that matter, any previous points. So there's an undo function that can be applied when you're digitizing. Again, when you get to that penultimate point, it's a right click, confirming the settings, 
and you can see we've now traced our field and we'll go into the process of editing just a little bit later how we can modify add additional vertices or delete vertices or move vertices as needed so that's the basics of creating areas very very simple click 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 left click right click to finish variation on that theme is creating rectangles as you can see where my cursor is located if I drag a box you'll notice I can simply create a rectangle clicking and holding with my left mouse button release and the rectangle is created if I want to constrain that as a square I hold my shift button down while I'm performing that action and all of the four sides will be of equal length again we click OK to confirm so those are the basics for creating areas uh, rectangular areas very simple click and drag and then um, the air, standard areas where you click at every vertex well as we saw earlier there again there are variations on those themes the idea of creating area features I'm going to toggle off my rectangle tool back to my digitizer in its native mode and I'm going to right click doesn't matter where I right click the same menu will be available I have nothing selected so I'm not performing an edit I'm merely going to right click as a means to choose another tool under the create area polygon features sub menu you can see while there's the same options for creating areas and for creating rectangles there's a lot of other options as well some of these are very specialized tools like range rings um, creating a grid creating a coverage area we'll deal with that one I think a little bit later um, but you will also notice that there are a couple of tools here that are probably going to be used quite commonly for instance creating circles um, the idea of being able to simply create a circular or elliptical area this is one tool that if you find yourself using it frequently it may be a good idea to assign it either to your favorites list or to a keyboard shortcut because you don't want to have to right click and search up and down to find this tool again accessing it through the favorites menu might be a good idea so with this tool I select that tool and the, the idea of creating a circle is simply click and drag to define the radius of the circle release and the circle is created now obviously in that situation I didn't have any say over the radius I couldn't specify that if you do have that requirement you can use the range rings tools which we saw when we right clicked but you can also access that range rings tool right here in the toolbar I'm not actually going to do this right now but one of the options when you create a range ring is first of all to select one as the number of rings these are typically concentric rings but in this case I've uh, selected one and um, you can also specify the specific radius of that uh, single uh, range ring and that will be an area that will be a polygon uh, of a specific uh, circle of a specific dimension a couple of other things I want to show you in this right click I'm kind of making a mess here so I want to move slightly so I get a a cleaner area of my map um, again through the right click menu no selected tool right now I'm not going to perform any edit against anything that's currently created and simply want to right click as a process for selecting new tools um, the idea of creating a rectangle or a um, rotated rectangle this is actually one of my favorite tools three-point draw is what it's called ultimately you are going to create a rectangle but you're going to do this uh, in a slightly different way I'm going to select this tool and I'm actually going to zoom in a little closer to my map here um, and I'm going to select uh, one of these buildings uh, one that looks rectangular this one lo looks like a good candidate right here if I wanted to trace the outline of this building and I use this simple area tool well the likelihood of me precisely uh, defining the rectangular structure is fairly remote I probably wouldn't be able to do that so this three-point draw gives me the option of first of all clicking on one of the corners moving my cursor along one of the sides it doesn't matter which one either the side or the end as my second click I define the length of that and as my third click I simply define the width so three clicks to create a perfect rectangle that as you can see quite accurately traces the outline of this building so three point draw rectangle is uh, that option couple more um, to introduce again I'll deselect that tool by selecting the digitizer once again right click again area polygon features areas of a fixed ground area square areas I should say specifically this is as it implies is a tool for dropping areas where you've predefined the the uh, the area of that that um, 
uh, feature. Um, in this case, I'm going to make these fairly small. I'm going to make them, uh, let's say, 300 square meters. And as you'll see, when I click OK, I get an indication of what that square will look like on my screen. And the anchor point is at top left corner. I simply click on the map and it drops that shape at that point. I can click again to drop another one. So I'm creating perfect squares that are precisely 300 square meters just simply by clicking on the map. And the final tool I want to show you, a more specialized tool, under my right click creating area polygon features, is to create an arc area. The idea of creating an arc essentially allows me to specify, first of all, a start angle from a point of origin. The point of origin I'm going to specify by clicking on the map, as you'll see in just a second. But the start angle from that is going to be a, essentially a bearing. I'm going to have a bearing of 45 degrees. So my arc will be kind of the uh, point of origin to the edge of the arc will be in the no a northeasterly direction. And the swept angle from there, I'm going to make that 90 degrees. So that will be a, a fairly large pizza slice if you like. Um, I can manually draw the extent which is what I'm going to do or I can specify the actual radius of the arc manually by entering that information here. Um, with these settings applied we'll click OK and I click a point of origin and I simply drag to create that arc area. Again from 45 degrees from, the, from north, that's northeasterly, uh, for an angle of 90 degrees. I'm creating an area confirming all the settings and you can see that arc now denoted there. So as you can see, there are tools in the toolbar for creating areas, points, and lines, but there's a lot more options in this right-click menu. Um, by the way, I didn't go into the right-click line features option, but you'll see a lot of these are identical to the menu for creating areas. A lot of the same um, geometric features can be created, except they're not technically filled features, but rather lines. So rather than getting a polygon, you'll get the boundary of whatever it is you're digitizing. For instance, my, my three-click, uh, three-point draw rectangle, I could have created an, a linear boundary as opposed to a polygon using the same mechanism, uh, but uh, from the Create Line Feature submenu. So creating objects in Global Mapper using the digitizer is very, very straightforward. Um, as you saw, every time I finished the completion process, I was prompted with a modify feature info, which I duly ignored um, in our next section. We'll take a look at that in more detail. And just to confirm that, you can see the next bullet on our list uh, is this modify feature info dialog box. I, I had um, considered actually talking about this as an introductory section, but without putting it in the context of having actually drawn anything, I figured we would wait till we go through the mechanism for drawing objects on the map and then more formally st stop and address the idea of, uh, of where to place these features, how to assign feature types, etc., etc. So by way of introducing this component, I'm going to recreate something we did very quickly earlier, and that's the outline of one of our fields here. Um, again, without too care and attention, we'll just complete the digitizing process by right clicking and we're prompted with the modify feature info dialog box. Going from the top you'll notice the first option is for me to assign a name to this feature and this would be the case regardless of what I had digitized whether it be an area or polygon, whether it be a line, whether it be a point. Um, I can assign a name. Now this is over and above what would be added as attributes. You can elevate um, a particular name to be assigned to that feature. And this would obviously be what would appear on the map uh, if you had labels um, assigned. So um, again, we've gone into more detail on the labeling process and how you can take, take an existing attribute and assign it to be a name. Um, look at some of our other presentations um, as far as uh, that process is concerned. But for the time being, I'm not going to add a name for this object I have uh, I've digitized. So we're going to leave that one empty. Feature type. Um, as I showed earlier, Global Mapper comes with a number of pre-configured feature types, and you can see the list here. Um, if there's something in this list that's relevant and pertains to what you're digitizing, certainly by all means you can select it. That allows you to choose um, a, a color. Uh, you can see in this case I've chosen cropland, and it's got this kind of off yellow color. Um, but it's pr 
probably more likely that when you're digitizing, you will have particular types of features that you want to assign. And if that's the case, you have the option here to create a new type. Um, you can do that here or you can do it in the configuration dialog box like we talked about previously. In this case, I'm going to create a feature type called fields. Um, I can define the fill pattern. I'm going to make it a solid fill and a color. Let's make it a green color. And I can also do the same with the border. I'll make it a solid border. Right now it's null. We'll make it a solid and we'll leave it as a, a black outline. So again, you can specify the visual characteristics that will be applied to this feature type. And this is not only for this one workflow, but once I've established this feature type, it will always be available to me from this drop down list. Um, everything else is fine here, but we could uh, um, assign a particular font for the label if that was relevant. We'll just leave that as is right now. We we'll click OK. And now that one is added to my feature type list. And we can continue that process by adding specific feature types that are relevant for our workflow. Using this in combination with the filtering I showed you previously, you can then create a subset drop down that is more specifically what you're going to be mapping as opposed to golf courses and isobath areas, things you may not use on a daily basis. You can remove those using that filter option. So the second selection, and perhaps the most important selection, um, is what layer that uh, do I assign this newly created feature to? You can see the default here is user created features. I would strongly encourage you, if you're digitizing, to either create a layer that more specifically addresses what it is that the layer contains, or select a layer that you have already. If you already had a fields layer and you're simply adding a new one, you can select that option and add that uh, to an existing layer. Um, user created features is a catch all. You'll find it will, uh, uh, certain features you create will automatically be placed in there. But I would suggest from a efficiency of workflow point of view that you bypass that as an option. And in my case, because I don't have any layers loaded, I'm going to create a new layer in this case. And you'll see in a few minutes after I click OK, I'll be prompted to give that layer a name. We can assign a description to that feature. We can override this style. Now, this seems like a contradictory function because what I did previously was uh, designate a feature type, which allowed me to predetermine the color. Well, having selected that, I can now manually override that and specify the style for that feature. I would truthfully suggest you don't pursue this workflow, except on those rare occasions where you quickly want to make something a red polygon. Um, if you want to differentiate the colors of objects in a layer, the best way to do that is using some sort of thematic mapping process. And we'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, so, But you can um, override the default style if you want by specifying that style when rendering the feature. We have options for either creating or editing attributes. Now, attributes can be assigned to feature types. You can have a feature that each feature type can have its own list of attributes, which makes the process of adding data very simple. You click the add, edit button and edit the attributes that are important, or you can add them manually. And again, if you're doing a lot of digitizing, the idea of adding attributes manually for every feature really doesn't make a lot of sense. Begin your process by creating a feature type with those attributes already um, uh, created. Uh, by the way, it's a grayed out option right now, but if you're digitizing for the purpose of adding an object to a layer that already has attributes, you can apply settings from that uh, layer by pre by pre selecting one of the existing objects in that layer before you digitize. I don't have that obviously available because I don't have anything selected. But that is a very good idea to have that um, selected uh, and choose this box pre populates the attribute table from what it sees in the selected object. You can also opt to automatic, automatically apply whatever settings you've established here in this first round to everything that follows. Um, I will go ahead and do that because one of the questions we get quite frequently is how do you revert back to the normal behavior again? Um, but suffice to say, with this box checked, I will not see this dialog box for the next polygon. Um, everything I digitize will be a feature called, uh, uh, called fields. It will be in a new layer, the layer I'm about to create, and all of the other settings will be retained as well. So I won't have a way of interacting for every digitized object. We'll click OK with these settings. I will be prompted to create the new layer. I'm going to call it fields once again because that's what I've designated that this layer will contain and we'll click OK. 
confirming the projection parameters inherited from what it sees on the display projection but I can override that if I need if I want this uh, layer to be natively projected in a different system it will still be rendered on the fly to state plane because that's my active projection on the map but I can override the native projection if I want I'll click OK to confirm state plane main west that is fine now very quickly I'm going to digitize another field right click to finish and you'll notice I didn't even see the dialog box and that's because that option was checked at the bottom of the modify feature info dialog box so how do I go back if I wanted to digitize the next object and it was a building um, it would automatically assume it was a, it was a field I don't have that control without seeing that box so how do you get back right click with the digitizer right click and you will notice at the bottom of this list there's an options menu many of these options are the same in fact they will all be available in the configuration dialog box this is a highlights list this is where we can do things like showing our vertices like we showed show before we can up to render deleted features if we delete something we'll address that in a few minutes where we talk about editing features um, we can adjust the snapping behavior um, we can adjust the selection parameters again things we saw when we opened the configuration dialog box previously these are exactly the same behaviors right at the bottom of this list is feature creation options which will confirm for me what I already know is that when I'm creating areas what I would previously created has been retained for my areas if I want to disable that we uncheck this box and click OK now next time I initiate a digitizing process for a new area it will prompt me once again and I would have to apply the settings manually for whatever that new feature happens to be so the modify feature info dialog box is the key to the assignment of digitized features to a particular layer and to a particular feature type now it appears when you digitize when you begin the process of digitizing uh, as you'll see it also appears when you initiate an editing process from an existing feature so we'll, we'll see that dialog box again in just a few minutes so in this next section uh, as you can see we're going to talk about rendering vector features I'm going to again deal very specifically with uh, with areas but the same principle can be applied to lines or to points obviously variation on point style variation on line style may be used there to reflect certain characteristics of your data or just uh, assigned manually so we'll talk about um, rendering features of uh, displaying features in a different way so once again we're looking at this uh, shapefile uh, of the uh, town boundaries in the state of Maine. This is a layer with polygons. This is a layer with areas. And we're going to talk about how we can change the visual characteristics of this layer. Um, if you've worked with shapefiles in Global Mapper, indeed for many of many file formats, um, it will have become apparent to you that when you import those features or render those features on the map, they are displayed in a very generic way. Um, areas are, are displayed with no fill and a black outline by default. Lines are going to be black lines, single pixel wide black lines, and points are going to be a single little black dot. Um, that is the default, and it's obviously something you can change. You can vary, and there are many, many different ways to change the visual characteristics of the features on the map you can change them manually if I wanted to change the appearance of a very specific polygon or group of selected polygons manually I do have the option of doing that I'll select maybe three or four maybe half a dozen or so or a dozen or so polygons here now if I wanted to change how they appear I can initiate an editing process for that and that is uh, active uh, or available when I activate the right click menu when I right click the very first option is edit and when I select edit the edit is obviously going to apply to what's selected and you will see as we introduced just a few minutes ago the modify feature info dialog box has now been displayed and in this dialog box I can do a couple of things I can either change the feature type which as we know will change the visual characteristics depending on what feature type I select but I can also override the style at this level again we talked about this when we created you can specify the style manually overriding what would be uh, used by default I would strongly discourage you from using this mechanism um, I would strongly encourage you if you want to specify a particular style for something that you do so based on a more methodical process by changing the feature type 
or by applying some sort of thematic pro mapping process, which we will do in just a minute. But I wanted to introduce this first by way of illustrating the fact that you can, at a featured level, override the default appearance and make it appear whatever way you want. I'll just go ahead and bring up the dialog box. We can change the color, solid fill, all sort of hatch pattern fills if necessary, um, and uh, any color options you want. Uh, boundary style, boundary color, boundary weight are also options in there as well. Um, so that is one option for changing the appearance of just selected objects essentially. Now if I wanted to change the appearance of all objects in this layer, there's a couple of ways I could go about that. I could essentially do what I did previously selecting objects but instead of limiting the selection to just a handful I could select everything I could right click in the overlay control center and choose select all that would select all of the objects in the layer or I could simply use my digitizer drag a box around the extent of the entire layer and again they would be selected I could initiate that right click edit option once again that would be one way of doing that changing everything collectively a more efficient way to achieve that is actually in the overlay control center in the overlay control center, you choose the options and under feature type, label and elevations, this is kind of a catch-all tab, looking specifically at feature types, you will note that the default feature type for layers that are imported into Global Mapper is unknown. And that, as I mentioned, is a, in this case, it's an area layer, so it's you know, black outlined on fill polygons. I can change that right here. I can make everything in this layer be a different feature type and as such be a different color. Now, just to illustrate this with some results I will know, I can make the, them all fields. I'll just apply that by, and leave the dialog box open. And as you can see, by changing the feature type at the layer level, now everything in this layer has been changed and indeed the colors have been assigned based on what I created earlier. So right here in the dialog box, uh, although they came in as unknown uh, areas, they are now fields. I want to revert them back to their default again because there are other ways of achieving what I just did. We'll click apply and they're back to the default appearance again. Under area styles, you will see the option that's chosen by default is to use the default style based on the classification or the feature type that was assigned. That's what we would expect. But once again, I have the option to override that. Now, this is almost identical behavior to what we looked at a few minutes ago, except this is now going to be applied at uh, the layer level. So everything in the layer is going to be changed based on manually overriding the style. The feature type technically would not change, which is a benefit because any attributes that I had assigned to that feature type would be retained, but I can override the default color for all objects manually using this option. Another option here is to apply styling based on an attribute. Now this is the, in essence, a thematic mapping process where we designate a color that reflects one of the attributes. I'm going to go through a very, very quick procedure to apply styling based on the county. Each of the counties uh, have been designated to each of the polygons. I think there are 16 counties in Maine. Uh, chastise me if I'm wrong on that one. I think there are 16 counties. We'll find out, I guess. And um, I'm going to designate a different color for each county. So I select that attribute and I choose initialize from values, which allows me to specify a default base color. And I'll choose red. Uh, this can be customized, by the way. You can change these colors in whatever way you want, as you will see. It's going to ask me if I want a random color assigned to each additional value. I'll click yes. And you'll see now the random colors have been assigned. And you can override these uh, with whatever colors you want. You'll see some of these colors are quite close together. But you can edit that style. I'll make this one um, a yellow color, for instance. Just a quick change here so we can see that now reflected with that particular uh, county. Um, sometimes it's a good idea to apply those colors to the map and then choose to override the color. So I'll click Apply. Keeps the dialog box open. You can see what colors have been applied. Then maybe I need to change some of these. And if that's the case, you simply can go into whatever selection, edit style, change the color once again. I'll make that one an orange color. Doesn't look like orange is on our map. Click OK and click OK. And we'll apply that change. And you can see this little area is now orange. So this is again a rendering process where, where, whereby the rendering now reflects a component of the data. I'm not going to go any further with that procedure because again it's something we've dealt with in more detail um, in other presentations. So we can change the appearance manually. 
We're going to change the appearance based on a feature type, which is what I would strongly recommend. Or we can override that and we can assign a color or assign a visual characteristic based on an attribute. Now there's one more thing I want to uh, um, illustrate here. And for this, I'm actually going to unload the data. It'll ask me if I want to save because I've changed some of the characteristics. I want to say no. I'm going to bring back the same file again. So we'll get back to our original appearance, which is all of these are unknown. So they're all going to be um, the uh, dark outline on fill polygons. As a default, if you want to change that default appearance, you can change the visual characteristic for unknown area types. And we're going to go back into our configuration dialog box for this. Again, if to remind you, these are global settings. So whatever I change in here will apply for every global, every global mapper instance, every workspace, every time we load up the software. Um, under area styles, I'm going to scroll down to the use. I'm going to find unknown area type. And if I want to change that default appearance so that instead of having a solid black border, I want them to have a solid red border. Every time I import a shape file or any vector file for which the feature type is not known or the visual characteristics are not known, it will automatically apply this color. So every shape file, again, regardless of its source, regardless of its structure, will appear as a red outline polygon instead of black. So that's a global setting that you can change to adjust the default rendering. I haven't touched on lines or points. But the principle is exactly the same when you're dealing with the visual characteristics for lines. Obviously, you're dealing with uh, line style, line width. For points, it's simply symbol style. But everything else would be exactly the same. So for many people who use the digitizer, the primary function is uh, the ability to edit objects. Uh, those files that you import, if you need to modify, change the structure, there are many, many tools in Global Mapper that allow you to, to adjust the geometric characteristics of your features and we'll, we'll introduce the main ones of those when we talk about editing vector features. So using the same data we've been using this uh, uh, shape file with the main towns. I've actually zoomed into an area along the coast and you'll notice how fragmented and, and broken up this state of Maine's coast is. Um, we're going to choose uh, one particular object to apply some of these modifications to. I'm going to choose an island. Let me zoom out just a little bit here. And we'll choose uh, this island and introduce some of the ways that we can adjust the geometric characteristics or uh, the uh, structure of this, uh, this feature. Now, in order to initiate any uh, change, any modification, um, obviously the digitizer needs to be activated. So I'm just going to select that tool. Again, it's an edit mode, which is appropriate in this case because I'm going to edit uh, this feature. I'm going to select it. And the indication it's selected, as we assigned previously in the configuration dialog box, is this yellow outline. Right off the bat, a couple of things that I can do as far as modifying this, this island is concerned. I'm not going to do it right now, but the delete key on my keyboard will simply remove this object from the display. Now, I have to clarify, I'm not actually deleting it from the shape file. The original file will still have this object, but Global Mapper's rendering of that shape file will not include this island. It will be omitted, and it will not be exported if that's part of my workflow. So deleting, quite simple. Use the delete key on your keyboard, easiest way to do that. There is also an option when I right click to delete that area feature, and same end result. While I'm in this right click mode, you'll notice another option which is elevated towards the top here is to move that area feature, to physically pick it up and drag it to a new location. I can also activate that function from the much more broad move reshape feature menu. I'm going to touch on some of these by way of addressing how we can modify this particular object. Again, we have a, a the similar the same function here, move feature. Control Shift M is the keyboard shortcut if you want to act, remember your those keyboard shortcuts. Variations on that theme, we can shift that. In other words, if we want to specify a direction and bearing that that particular selected object should move, we can specify that using this option. So variations on the theme of moving, I want to choose the first option. And as you'll see, I pick it up. And you'll see that ghost was retained in its original location. Uh, when I'm done, I simply hit I release, and it will move the object to that location. So my first geometric modification is a simple physical move to a new location. I'm going to deselect that. Uh, hit the escape button on my keyboard to deselect, by the way. And I'm going to hold the alt button down on my keyboard. 
You can't see that obviously, but take my word for it. Now I'm going to select it again. And you'll notice it's immediately in move mode. I can immediately pick it up and drag it to a new location. So if you do find yourself moving objects a lot, just hold the Alt button down when you select and drag with your cursor with your left mouse button held down and you can move it to a new location. So moving, very simple, very simple process, pick it up and drag. Or more specifically, if you want to shift it a particular direction bearing, you have that option as well in that right click menu. Rotating is another option. It's also available under move reshape uh, feature. I can rotate. You'll notice it's also included uh, in the same dialog box as scaling. I do have that as a toolbar option as well. I have a rotate option in my toolbar. Um, oops, I have to have it selected to be available. And you'll see a, tra a toggle button that will activate the same dialog box. This is just a shortcut to get to the same end result. If I click it, brings up a dialog box that lets me either rotate by a particular number of degrees by dragging, or if we were working with terrain data, there's an option to optimize our cut and fill volume calculations um, and de determine the optimal angle. That's a more specialized function. Want more information on that? Look at some of our, our 3D slash terrain analysis presentations and you'll get details on how that works. I'm going to choose the drag to rotate option here. And once again, because it's selected, my cursor now is a slightly different crosshair. I can simply pick up and drag. Oh, by the way, the reason <laughs> I just realized the reason it also changed it size is because in that dialog box I had a scale factor which allows me to introduce the scale factor uh, setting. I had previously set it to two. Let's go back and we'll set it back to one again and it'll hopefully bring it back to its original uh, size. I think I may need to drag once again for that to be applied. Oop. I think it retained the, the scale because of the uh, fact that it was set previously. So scale factor and rotation angle can be established in that one dialog box. So moving, um, rotating, very simple. What about changing the actual structure of the object itself? Uh, when I select it, you will notice that while it outlines the boundary, I'm not actually seeing the shape points that define this. And this is the first instance where I'm actually going to initia initialize the display of vertices. There is a toggle in the toolbar that allows me to initiate that. And you'll see if I select it, not only is this selected islands vertices display, but everything in every layer. And this can get kind of messy. In fact, it sometimes takes a little bit longer to render because it's rendering so many vertices. Not something I probably would want to, to keep on by default. In fact, I'm going to toggle that off right away. Instead, what I want to do is initiate one of the options from the right-click menu to always render vertices for selected features. That to me is a much more useful option. So while I'm not seeing vertices for all of the islands, I am seeing them for what I'm particularly interested in modifying. You'll notice that there's a red vertex. There's actually a green one there as well. That indicates the start and finish of that, that polygon. Um, the other vertices, as you can see, are blue by default. I can use my cursor, and the best way to do this is to click and hold with the left mouse button while dragging a box, but you can notice now I can select a vertex, or indeed I can select more than one vertex. As you can see, multiple vertices can be selected. I'm going to go back to selecting just one. Um, I'm going to right-click, and you'll notice in the context of what's been selected, again, there's a couple of options that have been elevated in this right click menu. One is to move that selected vertex and the other is to delete it. Now obviously deleting it, what you will go ahead and do right now is going to straighten out that line segment. What was previously a curved line or partially curved line or angled line I should say is now a straight line. Well, well, there was previously a shape point is no longer there. So you can obviously modify the structure of an object by removing vertices very easy. Um, moving them specifically, I'm going to take this guy right here, I'm going to right click once again and choose to move that vertex, puts me back in move mode, I can pick this up and drag it to a particular location if necessary. Um, another option is to insert a vertex. Now for this it doesn't matter where my cursor is initially, I'm going to go to vertex editing and I'm going to insert a new vertex into this selected feature. We'll select that option and insert vertex is now uh, available here. I simply click on the line segment where I want to insert that vertex and as you can see it's added it. I inadvertently released but I could also have immediately moved it to a new location. Knowing we still have that option I'll go ahead and uh, move that vertex and well again we can use that to adjust our, um, our the shape of the uh, of the feature. So 
adding vertices, deleting vertices, moving vertices, all very, very straightforward, all very simple. You can also um, select multiple vertices, as I mentioned before, and collectively edit those. You will have noticed this vertex editing submenu um, where you can go, go right down to the uh, feature vertices themselves and edit them. You can choose this, uh, right, this uh, right click menu and you get a highlighted list of the vertices that you have selected along with the others that uh, comprise this uh, polygon. And these are all editable as well. You can edit the position. If there is elevation values associated with these, you can add elevations or, or for that matter, edit any of the elevation values. You can edit the length. So you can see you can get right down to the specific numeric values that are associated with these vertices and modify them as necessary. So one of the other tools you may have noticed in that menu um, is the option from vertex editing to smooth the line. There's an option to simplify, and simplify as you can see um, reduces the number of vertices, it essentially removes redundant vertices to, uh, to, uh, to simplify the line, simplify the line segment without altering the geometric structure too much. But there's also an option here to smooth the line. And smoothing the line is probably best illustrated by this little section right here where we uh, um, place this additional vertex. Uh, if I initiate a smoothing process, you will notice immediately that line segment is smoothed. And you can repeat that process uh, for as many times as you want. In fact, now that we have selected that tool once, it will be automatically listed in our recently used tools. And I can simply click the little green button to continue to smooth the line. And every time I do, you'll hopefully see that island is now smoothing itself out, changing the structure. Th that tool is uh, particularly useful if you initi initiate any uh, vectorizing from raster. Um, if you um, draw uh, polygons based on extracting uh, colors, the polygon boundaries will adhere to the pixel boundary, so they'll obviously be very angular. So you can initiate this process to create a smoother boundary or a smoother line if you like. So smoothing, um, very simple process, right click, uh, initiate from the vertex editing menu, but you can also then complete or continue the process by clicking that green button. Now, over the course of the last couple of minutes, we've done a lot to this island. We have moved it, rotated it, uh, adjusted its scale inadvertently, um, and then smoothed it. What is the revert? How do you get back to where it started? Well, this is something, again, a question we get quite frequently. How can I undo what I've just done? Um, there's a couple of ways that you might want to look at this for your workflow. One is based on uh, workspaces. If I it was embarking on a digitizing process where I wanted to be able to go back to a particular point in time. Saving a workspace at that point in time allows you to simply load up an older workspace and it will revert back to how that was saved at that uh, at that point. So that's probably the easiest way to maintain and to manage your your workflow. So you don't uh, any edits you apply can be uh, reverted back to the original. There is also a restore function that can be applied to a selected item. Um, I'm going to select that polygon. I'm I'm going to right click and from the move reshape features because that has been selected and because it has been modified right at the top here is an option to s restore the original shape of that area. It will warn me that any changes I applied are going to be um, overwritten and that's fine. We'll click yes and you can see now it's back to its original structure. So don't worry about messing up. <laughs> you can always restore uh, an object to the way it was originally. So those are just some of the options that you can apply for editing or changing the geometric structure of features on the map. In this next section, we're going to talk about converting vector features. And when I say converting, what I mean is if you have points and you want to create a line, um, or if you have a polygon and you want to create points, how can you make those conversions? How can you create data from your existing data? Uh, basically, any type of data can be converted into any other type of data. And there are multiple ways of doing that, as you will see. I've moved my map to a blank area, um, as I mentioned previously, it's probably not very realistic to initiate a digitizing process when you don't have any frame of reference. But to illustrate some of these tools, uh, it's a good idea to start with a clean slate. So I have nothing on the map. And I'm going to go through a couple of different workflows to show how we can uh, perform these conversions. Uh, first thing I'm going to do is create an array of points. I'm going to drop my first point on the map. I'm not concerned about the settings for this application. In fact, I'm going to automatically apply these settings as I showed you previously. So I'm going to create m a multiple 
uh, multiple points just in a circle if you like. So this may be comparable to perhaps some data you may have uh, uh, created yourself or may have collected. Uh, these are just points. Um, obviously, uh, the, you know, the workflow here may require you to, to connect the dots, to join these up into a linear form. And the process is very simple. Uh, with the digitizer, you first select all of the points. I'm just dragging a box that encloses all of the points. With them all now selected, all I need to do is right click and I go to my advanced feature creation options menu. This is one of the components in the digitizer that is context specific. So what the options you see available here are going to reflect what has been selected. So the fact that I now have points selected, um, I have the option to create a new line feature from these points. And I'll go ahead and do that. I will um, um, decide if I want a distance threshold. Um, you'll notice if that is retained at zero, uh, it will um, allow any distance. So I'm going to leave that at zero. But if you want to be more, want to have more control or be more specific over that distance threshold, you can enter that information here. I'll simply click OK. And confirming the line parameters, again, this is a, we're creating a new line. It's almost like we digitized it manually. So again, we'll go with the defaults in this case. And there is my new line segment. You'll remember back, this was the first point I added and digitized until I got to my last point. So um, that is my line segment. Very simple process for creating a line from a set of points. Taking that principle to the next level, what if I wanted to use this line to create a polygon. And let's say I want my need was to determine the area enclosed within what were previously points. Well, this is again a very simple process. From the same right click menu, this time the line has been selected. Advanced feature creation options. Different choices in here because a line has been selected. So I can create a new area from the selected line. Now again, in this case, I'm going to have the option to, to determine what the spacing will be between these line segments. Unfortunately, I've lost the context of my scale here, so I'm going to make a guess. I'm going to keep this rather high, actually. If it fails, we can come back and, and enter a different value. I'm going to assume that, well, you know what, I'll bump it even more. So the fact that it's only one line, it will not have any drastic side effects. So we'll, we'll bridge the gap here with a very large threshold distance. Um, this is just a single line, by the way, but the same process could equally well be applied if you had multiple lines that outline the bounds of what want you want to be a polygon. So in a, rather than just connecting the two ends together, it'll connect multiple line segments if that's uh, a required part of your workflow. We click OK on this. Um, it's remembered the fields from before. We'll leave that as is. We'll pretend there's a field here. Click OK. And although it's not immediately apparent because it is in its selected mode, this is now a polygon. So we started with points migrated to lines and ultimately migrated to areas. So not a very uh, difficult process, but very powerful being able to, to restructure your vector data as you can see. Next thing I want to do is start with a line. I'm going to again drag my map off to the side here. So we start with another clean slate and I'm going to just simply arbitrarily draw a line on my screen. Once again, I'm not concerned about the parameters. It's simply a line segment and from this, I want to create some points. I want to create point objects. There are actually a couple of different ways of doing that. The simplest way is for me to create point where there are currently vertices. That's a very simple process. So in any line, whether it be something you create or a line that you import, if you simply want to designate a particular point uh, with its own symbol, with its own feature, you can do that very quickly. Right click advanced feature creation options once again and create new points from selected area and line features. That behavior will automatically create points at the vertices. The alternative to that, as you can see right above, is to create point features that are spaced along that uh, selected feature. So in my case, I have a line and I want to create points, not points that coincide with the vertices, but points that are independently placed based on, on whatever settings that I have applied here. So I'll check that, I'll choose that option. And a couple of variations on this theme. One is to create a, num a fixed number of points and the other is to, to create them at a fixed distant in, distance interval. Um, in this case, I'm going to do the fixed number. And I'm going to type in the number 10 right here. In other words, what's going to happen is it's going to place 10 points along this line equally spaced. 
Now, I do not want to keep the original vertices. In other words, I do not want points where there are existing vertices. I'm going to uncheck that box. If this was a 3D line, if it was a, uh, a line where there were Z values associated with these vertexes, the distances would be slightly different. And I could factor that in when the, the, the points are spaced if necessary. Everything else, I think, should be fine. Um, we'll click OK. And as you can see, we now have 10 points equally spaced lin in a linear fashion along that line that I created. So that is just an illustration of how we can take a line and create points from the line. The same would also be true for areas, by the way. Obviously, in an area, the points would be spaced around the boundary of the area, as opposed to along a linear path, but rather along the, uh, the outlining perimeter of, of the uh, polygon. Same principle would, would apply, though. The final thing I want to show you, and I'll go back to state of main for this, is the ability to generate a centroid point. Now here we are starting with polygons. I'm just going to choose a sample selection here. I've got my vertices on. I want to turn the vertices off in this case. So once again, under options, we can uncheck rendering of vertices. So I've got, uh, what, maybe 25, 30 or so polygons selected. and once again, if I right click, we have advanced feature creation options. So for each of our data types, for points, for lines, and now for areas or polygons, we have a context specific set of options for creating new data from what has been selected. And with areas, there's an even longer list of options. We can create randomly distributed points within each area. We can decide how many points and we'll place those randomly in each area. We can uh, create new points from our selected area. And in other words, that would be per vertex, as we saw before. We can create new points at the centroid, which is exactly what I want to do. So we'll go ahead and select that option. Options here for, to move the centroid point inside if it's outside. That would be in an extreme case if the polygon was in a regular shape and the geometric centroid was outside. We can move it in. And to create a single point for grouped areas, we don't have that option or that need here. We'll just simply click OK. And as you can see, we now have points nicely tucked inside each of these areas. So we took polygons, created points. These points are geometrically centered, by the way. They are right in the center of each polygon. So variations on that theme of taking existing objects and creating objects of a different geometric structure. In this next section, we're going to take the idea of editing vector features and apply some very specific uh, workflows. Uh, we're going to look at splitting and combining both lines and polygons. And obviously, this doesn't apply to points. Points are single entities, isolated uh, points. So there's no necessity to do perform any, any splitting or, or joining. But with um, lines or polygons, we'll go through a couple of different workflows where we can split them or we can join them uh, depending on your requirements. So once again, I have my blank slate. I'm going to initiate a very quick digitizing process to illustrate some of these uh, some of these tools. Uh, first one, very simple. I'm going to create a very simple line. As you can see, we'll put a few vertices in here. And without uh, too much attention compared to the uh, uh, Modify Feature Info dialog box, I do want to make sure that we're displaying our vertices. So I right click and we will turn on the vertices for our selected feature. And we will then duly select it. Now, this splitting of a line requires me to select a particular vertex. If I wanted to split this one line segment into two, um, I'm going to choose a particular vertex to split that line. This is another situation where I could do this with multiple vertices if I wanted. If I wanted to select uh, several vertices and split at each of the selected vertices, I would have that option as well. I'm just going to do it for this one uh, vertex right in the middle. Now, as a result, I'll, it'll create two line segments for me. Um, this action is initiated from one of the menus we haven't looked at yet, which is crop combine split functions. Because a line has been selected, it's given me the option to split at that selected vertex uh, or vertices if that was the case. Um, we'll go ahead and choose that option. That's all there is to it. Now if I choose the segment over on the right, you'll see it's now terminated right here. And similarly, um, on the other side, that one is terminated as well. So what was previously a single line segment is now two line segments. Two reverse that process. I'm just going to use exactly the same two line segments that I looked at previously. And to reverse that process, we'll s uh, select both of them, hold the uh, uh, control button down on my keyboard while I'm selecting both of them. Right click once again, as you would expect, under crop combine split functions. And this time, we want to combine the selected line features into a single line. 
So we'll choose that option. Define the distance threshold between those two lines. Uh, I'm, I, these should <laughs> theoretically be right on top of each other, but just to be sure, I'm going to make it a distance threshold of 10 meters in this case. And um, we'll click OK. Uh, we can opt to make sure that particular um, attributes match in order to initiate that that uh, uh, joining process. In other words, if you want only want lines of a particular type to join together, you can make the selection here that you can ignore those that are are not uh, the same uh, type of feature. Uh, if that's a choice, in my case, I don't care. So any overlapping touching features will will be uh, connected. We click OK, and as expected, now that what was previously two line segments is now a single line. So very simple, splitting, joining lines in this case. Hit the delete button, we'll delete that. I'm going to back out because we're still looking at our main map over here. In this case, I want to use a combine function applied to uh, polygons. Once again, I'm going to turn off the display of my selected, vertice, or selected features vertices. And let's say for this select group of polygons. I want to combine them into one. Um, right click once again. Crop combine split functions. Because this is now polygon selected, my options are different. But you'll see I now have the option to combine the selected features uh, into a single area. Once again, I can choose, if necessary, only to combine those that match a particular attribute structure. I'm not worried about that. In this case, we'll simply click OK. And you can see now we have one large polygon where previously there were several small ones. What about splitting a polygon? I think the easiest way for me to illustrate this is to choose an isolated polygon. And we'll go into one of these ones that's fairly small. Um, we'll take this guy right here. And I want to split this polygon um, based on a line, an intersecting line. So the first action I'm going to do is just going to draw a line right through the middle of the polygon. I'm not concerned about the characteristics, it's just a line. So I want to use this line almost like a knife to cut this polygon, which is currently a single object, but I want to cut it in two based on this line. The way I do that is simply to select both. The line is selected, the polygon is selected. Once again, from my right click, crop combine split functions, I'm now, I now have the area to crop the selected area to the selected lines. And you'll notice both of these are plural options, so I could do this with multiple features and or multiple lines, uh, multiple area features and or multiple lines if necessary. So we'll just choose this option and very quickly you'll now see that I now have two polygons where the line now forms the boundary between the two. The opposite process can also be applied. And for this, I'm going to choose another polygon here. I'm going to draw another line. But I want to use the polygon in this case to cut the line. Once again, I initiate this process through first selecting both of them. I go to the same right click menu as before under crop combine split functions. But in this case, I want to crop or split the line features to a selected area or areas. So this is actually going to give me a couple of additional options as you'll see when I choose this, uh, this uh, option from this menu. Because it will allow me to remove the segments of the line that are outside the polygon or to keep them and just create th uh, different line segments. In this case, it will be three line segments. I'll opt for the second option in this case, which selection of no in this case, and I will end up with what was previously a single line. Now, it's hard to see because they're quite faint, the selection, but I now have three line segments now associated with this line, this what was what previously a single line. Back out and show you one more cropping function here. And for this, I'm very quickly going to draw a circle. And as we saw previously, we activate the circle tool from the right click menu. This is a uh, create area feature. We're going to create a new circle, circular or elliptical area. Once again, if we had this as a favorite, it would be an option to choose it from the favorites list. I'm simply going to draw a very quick circle right here doesn't matter about the settings. In fact, I think I will revert this back to my unknown. I reverted it back to the dark outline, so it'll just be a, a, a dark colored uh, polygon or outline of a polygon. And I want to crop 
all of the vector features to this polygon. In other words, I want to retain what's inside this circle, removing what's outside. And for this, I select that. This is almost like a cookie cutter. I want to cut out um, and remove what's outside. I do have the option to invert that logic, by the way. But in my case, I want to keep what's inside, removing everything that's outside. This is a case where it doesn't matter where I click on the map because this polygon is selected. The menu that I see will be specific to that polygon. So I right click, crop combine split function. I'm going to crop the loaded features to that selected area is the option I want to choose. And once again, there's a dialog box that lets me fine tune this behavior. Do I want to place them in the same layer? I can put them in a new layer if necessary. Do I want to limit the cropping to just lines or areas or points? And do I want to mark them as deleted? I'm going to choose that option. So um, everything that's uh, outside will be removed. And I this is the option to revert, by the way, uh, to invert, to keep the data outside rather than inside if I choose that box. Everything else should be fine. We'll click OK. And if everything goes according to plan, uh, when this dialog box completes, it looks like I've chosen probably a too large an area. But when it completes, um, my coverage will be constrained by the boundary of the polygon that I had previously selected. So I've limited the extent to just what you see on the screen. Now, there is one final um, workflow I want to illustrate here. And that is to address the idea of intersecting features, specifically intersecting lines. And with this, once again, I'm going to arbitrarily draw a line. And I'm also going to draw an additional line that intersects. Now, these two lines are obviously completely independent. There's no geometric relationship between the two right now. I simply created them. Um, what I want to do is, first of all, select both of them, because I want to split them both and place vertices uh, or, or place vertices. I could, pl I could pl place vertices or simply place points, but I actually want to split them both into four separate line segments. Um, and this could be obviously done for multiple intersecting lines concurrently. And in my case, I've only got two lines, but the same process would work. Again, once more, right click. We're back in our crop combine split functions because these are lines. The, limit of the, the options are limited to line features. And I want to insert vertices and have the option either or to split at intersection of these features. In other words, I'm going to address the fact uh, that they do intersect each other. And as you'll see, I can determine what to do at that intersecting point. I can insert vertices and split. I can simply insert vertices but not split the line. Or I can only split lines at existing intersections. Well, I want to go with the first options, where I now have two lines. When I click OK, I should end up with four. Would I like to create point features the line intersections? In this case, no. I don't actually need to create points. Confirming there were six modified features. Now, why are there six when there's only two lines? Well, if you consider the two original lines and now the four line segments I've created, that total six in this case. So what I have now is one line segment, two line segments, three line segments, and four. And technically, the original line, two lines, have been deleted and replaced with what you see here. So those are just some examples of cropping, splitting, or using one geometric feature, uh, one object, lines or polygons, to interact or to perform sort of cr some sort of cropping process against another type of feature. In this final section, I'm going to uh, talk very briefly. I notice uh, we've gone a little longer than we usually do, but I'm going to talk very briefly about some of the more advanced digitizer tools, some specialized tools um, that ultimately let you create vector features, but there's more automated procedures or more workflow specific procedures that you follow uh, to create these features. Now, the first tool I want to talk about is Kogo. Um, coordinate geometry. It's a button in the toolbar uh, right here where my cursor is located. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six button in from the left. Um, this is the exception to the rule I let out earlier as far as digitizing is concerned where I mentioned it's most common to use an existing layer for the basis for digitizing whether that be raster or an existing vector layer. This is a tool you can employ without any pre-existing reference because the way this works is you create features by simply entering their dimensions, the known dimensions. Um, the first uh, selection, as you'll see when you uh, select a button, is to determine a point of origin. Now, this may be a case where you need to identify this visually, but you can also 
enter the point of origin manually by either selecting an existing point or by typing in a point of origin, as you'll see in a second, a point of origin for the uh, the uh, coordinates. So I'm just going to click an arbitrary location on the map to bring up the dialog box. Process of creating features with the digitizer simply is a case of entering distance and bearing, um, or distance and angle, as the case may be, depending on your requirements. There are variations on the input method, uh, but ultimately it's the same end result. Um, the start position can be set, as I mentioned, it can be set manually based on entering some coordinates. We'll assume where I placed is correct. From that point, I simply enter the values. I'm going to enter a value of two kilometers in this case, and we're going to go for a bearing of 45 degrees. Now, hopefully, I've chosen a scale that's correct. And if I click Add Point, you'll notice that I can actually see the results of that in real time. So from my defined point of origin, I'm not able to create a feature um, based on simply entering these values. We'll bump that up to five uh, kilometers and we'll change our bearing to let's say 80 which should bring us down kind of in a, a south southeasterly direction. We'll add another point. Oops, I'm sorry. 80 is of course not. That's I was thinking 180, but that's uh, just before, just uh, north of uh, east in this case. Um, and I'm not going to go any further with the line, but you can see I can now continue that process and, and create the line uh, based on those dimensions or based on a bearing. I'll just put in one more line segment, this time based on an angle of 90 degrees. And that's going to be an angle based on uh, the alignment of the previously created line segment. This time I'll go up to 10 kilometers and add a final point here. So you can see digitizing without actually clicking on the map, but simply by entering those measurement values. If you have access to maybe the legal description for a property boundary, for instance, this is how you can create that property boundary very, very precisely by entering its known dimension. So that is a more advanced tool, uh, Kogo. Let me cancel that. I'm not going to create the feature and I'm going to lose all my work, which is fine. And let's back out just a little bit and we've got our state of main here. Just again to give us a visual context. Another specialty tool right here where my cursor is located is a grid tool. This grid tool allows you to create a grid of tiles, if you like, based on entering a specified number of rows, specified number of columns, and, and a distance for each. I'm not actually going to do this in the interest of time, but this would create a an array of tiles, which is great for things like sampling, uh, scientific type sampling, or a lot of people are using this as the basis for tiling imagery, where you want to create tiles of a specific size. You create these grid tiles first and select them. You can then initiate a cropping process or indeed you can go right to the um, uh, export function and use your tiles as the basis for the uh, the tiling process during export. So a couple of variations on this theme to point out. Um, by default it will create areas but you can also create points. Um, points uh, would allow you to create a regular array of points where those grid tiles intersect. I've I have been asked in the past how to create some points regularly spaced and this is the method you would do that it's a little bit of a variation on the theme of creating a grid where you simply designate the intersections but it allows you to create those point features so again that's another specialty digitizer tool buffering is another one uh, for this I'm very quickly going to create a line segment and we are going to initiate a buffering process around this line. Again, like all the digitizing functions, the line first needs to be selected. One of the buttons that appears when a feature or more than one feature is selected is the buffering tool. Buffers are area features that extend outwards from either one or more selected features. And we define what that distance is. We can create more than one buffer zone if necessary. We can create concentric buffer zones. In this case, I'm going to just going to create one. And we can specify the distance. I'm going to make a 10 kilometer buffer outside of this uh, designated feature. A number of additional options in here in terms of determining uh, the structure of the buffer. I'm just going to leave the other options as they are. We'll click OK. And you can see it's created this buffer area. If we had more than one feature selected and those buffers intersected, we, can, we have an option to combine them into one large geometric feature as opposed to overlapping feature. So again, this is another um, more advanced digitizing tool. We have options to 
create holes inside of features. I'm going to choose a polygon here and I want to create a hole right in the middle. Now the way I do that is either to import the geometric layer that defines the extent of the hole. In my case I'm just going to draw it. I'm just going to draw a arbitrary polygon. I'm going to use that as the basis for creating a hole. Now right now this is one large rectangular feature. If I select the smaller feature inside the smaller polygon and I right click I'm going to go back to the combine, uh, uh, crop combine split function option we had earlier. And now I have the option, because this is an area, to cut the area from another area. I choose it. This is almost like having chosen a cookie cutter. I choose the dough, if you like, to use that analogy. And I want to uh, remove what has been um, at the hole. I want to delete it, so I'll se select yes. And now if I select the polygon, I both have an external and an internal border. It's got a hole right in the middle. Now, that tool can be used for a lot of different applications. Obviously, right in the middle of a polygon, you can create a hole, like a donut, if you like. But you can also use it very creatively for doing things like edge matching. So two abutting polygons, you can use one to cut a section from an adjacent polygon to ensure there's no overlap. So they don't have to necessarily, the two polygons don't have to be completely overlapping, or one does not necessarily need to be inside the other one. You can create a partial hole, or in this case, it will be an edge match by applying that tool along the, the periphery of an existing polygon. Now for this last scenario I've actually loaded up another file. Uh, let me go to my overlay control center which is off screen. I'll drag it in a little bit and I'm going to go to a, another shape file. I'm going to zoom to that shape file. I can right click and zoom to the selected layer and I want to turn off all of the other layers so we can see more clearly what we have here. This is a polygon. It's a long thin polygon and it's actually a river. Uh, I believe it's the boundary of a river body. Now what we had done a few minutes ago was initiate a buffering process where we um, selected a line or it was a line but we could have selected lines points and or polygons and create an area. What I'm going to do now is essentially the reverse of that process and this is useful for many many different applications where I, I'm going to start with a polygon and I'm going to create a center line from that polygon. Uh, this tool can be applied if you've got polygons designating road uh, roads and you want a road center line or in my case I want a river channel center line so rather than de designating this this river as a polygon I want to designate, designate it as a line. So it's an in inverse of the buffering process. So with the polygon selected, I right click, I go to my advanced feature creation options, and right here towards the bottom I create area skeletons. We define these as skeletons because almost it, it provides a central structure if you like, um, or center lines is the other way of describing these. Um, it's creating a new line, so I have the option to designate the line characteristics. I'll just simply click OK. and. Oh, I turned off the layer, that's why they're not appearing. Got that warning message. I'll turn on my user created features once again, and there we go. We can now see the line. So that line, geometrically speaking, is now the center point of the outer polygon. Geometrically, it's uh, it's almost uh, like the tool that we used a few minutes ago where it created a point in the geometric centroid. This time we're creating a line uh, that's right along the geometric center of the uh, the polygon. So created an inverse buffer, if you like. So that brings us to the end of the session for today. Um, hopefully those of you who have uh, not used the digitizer or maybe just used it for certain very basic functions will have been introduced to some of the new tools you have at your disposal. Um, as you saw on that right click menu especially, there's a lot of different functions can be applied. Um, a lot of different edits, a lot of different cropping, splitting functions can be applied to, to vector objects, whether they'll be objects you create yourself or as, a, as it was the case with the data we were looking at today, uh, a file that's imported. Um, as you can see on the screen, we have a couple of avenues that you can follow as far as getting help is concerned. One is our email address. If you have any questions about anything you, you heard in today's presentation or anything from previous presentations or just gen questions in general, we have a help staff that's always going to be available, geohelp at bluemarblegeo.com. Um, I'll put a plug in for the forum as well. If you want to uh, interact with uh, other Global Mapper users, um, ask questions or indeed answer questions, uh, you can go to the forum, register. I strongly encourage you to register. And 
and you can browse through the topics or as I said you can post your own questions in there and you'll get some uh, peer to peer learning opportunities um, if you're not currently using Global Mapper um, I do strongly encourage you to download the software you can download it directly from our website um, once you load it up you have the option to register a seven, uh, 14 day trial I'm sorry and you can put it through its paces and see if it works for you so Next month, we will be rolling out a update to version 17 of Global Mapper, and it will be a live webinar. So look out for registration information for that in the next few days, and I look forward to speaking to you next time.